I seek to contribute because I am a proud New Zealander. I am a Kiwi through and through, having spent most and almost all my life in Whangarei in Auckland. There are those that question what it means to be a New Zealander. They suppose we lack an identity or lament that it is not what they would wish it to be. I have no time for such a myopic perspective. New Zealand has a clear and strong identity which has grown and evolved over the centuries that have preceded us. Most Kiwis know who they are and what they stand for and spend very little time worrying about labelling it. Some of our principles have changed over time, but the most important ones, our fundamental values, have not. From Kansas International, I'm Matt Laveau, and this is the Kansas Podcast. In this series, we will explore the potential union between Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. How can this alliance increase freedom of movement, free trade, and foreign policy cooperation between the Commonwealth countries? To find out, I welcome Simon O'Connor, who is a member of parliament in the New Zealand parliament, representing the writing of Tamaki in New Zealand and part of the National Party. It's good to be with you, Mr. O'Connor. Oh, it's a pleasure, Matt. Thank you for the welcome. So I was with your brother last month, actually, uh, Simon Bridges, and we had a great conversation together about the multiculturalism in New Zealand. So it was a pretty interesting topic. Yeah, um, so he's my brother-in-law, married his sister about five years ago. Um, fortunately, no politics involved there. <laughs> right. But yeah, so the, the other Simon's are quite right in that, you know, New Zealand, and I'm sure the same goes for Canada and the other realms, that we are a very multicultural society now. And, you know, that's a really important point for anyone considering Kanzuk because uh, it's often seen, oh, it's just a whole lot of, you know, old imperial countries. And you go, no, no. So much has changed. We right. are a very diverse, very multicultural country now. That's right. And Mr. O'Connor, I think it'd be interesting for the listeners to, le- to know a little bit about your experience with Kanzuk and how you first found out about it. Yeah, so I've been aware of Kanzuk for many, many years now, well before coming actually into parliament. Um, I used to uh, chair a, a constitutional monarchy group, the equivalent of your Monarchist League of Canada with the uh, Rob Finch or Bob Finch to anyone who knows him. But long and short, uh, James Skinner way back then got in contact just as a, well, a a point of interest. So I've I've followed it quite closely ever since and then been uh, thrilled in recent months to be asked by the leadership of my party and my colleagues to to lead Kanzuk in New Zealand. That's really interesting. And so now you are actually spearheading a, a Kanzuk parliamentary group in the country. And I wanted to know a little bit about the group itself and what the, the next couple of months will look like and what you guys have in store for it. Yeah, well, the group's uh, just forming up. So we haven't had one uh, before, uh, certainly not that I'm aware of uh, here in the New Zealand parliament. So just beginning to invite uh, MPs, so from the New Zealand side, engaging uh, with them and then inviting guests into uh, speak. So we've had Lord Hannon um, at one point. We've got Paul Bristow. I've uh, been talking to uh, your side as well in Canada. So the likes mm-hmm. of uh, Ed Fast and Kerry Lynn, uh, Scott Atkinson and, and other Canadian MPs, and then to Australian. So long and short, just trying to start those uh, conversations. And it's my hope that that will then uh, broaden out into well, a lot more discussion here in the Parliament Uh, going forward and look with a spot of luck we can build on a momentum which many of the other countries Canada in particular uh, have generated and besides the obvious benefits that a cancer agreement can bring do you think that it's important to remind ourselves of the uh, the geopolitical aspect of it and how uh, multilateralism between these four countries are important when uh, making big decisions on the world stage oh I think absolutely critical for me it's one of the top uh, reasons. I mean, I'd better be careful in terms of, you will, pri- prioritizing the benefits of Kanzuk. But, you know, mm. we're, we're living in a world that is uh, more dangerous, I would suggest. Um, and we're seeing a, a fracturing of the, the multilateral order. So, so anything which actually brings countries together, and particularly with our four nations, common values, uh, common systems to speak as one, um, is being a little bit uh, flippant, a no-brainer. Um, so bring it on. And Mr. O'Connor, when talking about Kanzuk, the four countries would use the same currencies that they own, that they have, correct? There wouldn't be like a one Kanzuk currency. I don't think so. In the, certainly not in the first instance. Um, 
I don't think it's required. Um, and I think it's going to be one of those particular issues which people can get um, a little upset about. In other words, right. there's a real connection that people have to their own money. And you know, if I use New Zealand and Australia, for an example, we don't have the same currency, even though our countries are so closely aligned. So it could happen. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen, but I, I don't think it's a, a necessary aspect of Kanzo. Speaking of, you know, you mentioned how important it is with the ever increasing dangerous world we live in. You are a, a member of the Select Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defense and Trade. So do you think that Kanzo can actually strengthen international security in the world? Oh, I, I think it can. I mean, what we're seeing at the moment is some, some bad actors on the world stage trying to, as I say, break down that multilateral order. Uh, and even with countries like our own, just sort of trying to separate us um, in, in different ways, trying to isolate uh, the countries. So the fact that we could speak together as a group uh, would make a huge difference. And in fact, Matt, if I might say, even just the fact that we could get around the table, these four countries and talk together would be a huge step you know, consistently. I mean, it's really important for your listeners to understand that the likes of Canada, Australia, the UK and New Zealand do talk regularly, but Kanzuk would formalize that. And that in itself would be a huge uh, step forward, let alone consistently publicly speaking together on important geopolitical issues. And so as of April 12th, New Zealand and the UK are coming close to securing a major post-Brexit trade deal. And so do you think that removing these import taxes and um, you know, just making sure that there are less and less tariffs, do you think that that could actually promote eventually an actual Kanzuk trade deal where legislators will actually use the word Kanzuk? And you know, because it seems that every, every trade deal does come closer to a Kanzuk deal, but there is no Kanzuk, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think it could. Um, I mean, trade is obviously an important aspect of Kanzuk. We are seeing at the moment pretty much bilateral deals, but it doesn't take too much creativity in mind to see how four separate bilateral deals could actually morph into one greater. Um, and a good example of that is what they call the CPTPP, uh, the which briefly the Trans-Pacific Partnership of which Canada and New Zealand are part of. In other words, we have a bilateral agreement with the likes of Canada, um, but we are also operating within a, a wider uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership framework. So there's no reason that couldn't happen with Kanzo. And speaking of, you know, the domestic politics, Mr. O'Connor, you know, it's, it does seem that, you know, within New Zealand, it's much more uh, conservative. Maybe I'm wrong, but do you think that it eventually it, w- it will become a bipartisan support within New Zealand Parliament? I would hope so. Um, I would hope so. I think, in fact, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost critical that that happens. It, it's not absolutely necessary. It's it's more conservative MPs lean towards Kanzuk than certainly my colleagues on the left. But I'd, I'd better be really clear to your listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a number of MPs on the Labour or left side who are, are open to this. So if we can keep it bipartisan, that would be uh, really, really positive. I think the biggest challenge here is just building uh, greater awareness and ensuring it doesn't become uh, a partisan issue. That, that would be... It won't stop Kanzuk happening. It'll just slow things down here in New Zealand. And Mr. O'Connor, what does New Zealand need to do in order to promote this idea of Kanzuk uh, within the public? Because, you know, within Canada, there is strong support, but the majority of people don't know what Kanzuk is. So what do you think needs to be done in order of public awareness? It's probably two things. Um, But if I might start, the the reason it's not... uh, front and centre of New Zealanders' minds is is probably because it's too obvious, which might seem like a strange thing to say, but Mm -hmm. it's such a, as I mentioned earlier, a no-brainer, so obvious that a lot of New Zealanders don't even think about it. It's as if the idea is right under their nose and consequently they they don't see and think about it. So I think it's a two-fold step. One is building awareness within uh, the parliament because ultimately the MPs are, are change makers and people who can actually you know, go back to their ridings um, or as we'd call them electorates and speak to the people. 
And then secondly, once we've got a good number of MPs on board speaking positively, to build the wider social awareness. In other words, use social media, write out op-ed pieces, engage the journalists, and just begin to, to make obvious the idea, which is, as I say, front and center of Kiwis, or should be front and center. And I want to talk about immigration now. So uh, last podcast, I talked to Simon Bridges about the Trans-Tasman travel arrangement. And I was wondering, because, you know, it, it, there are many restrictions regarding immigration between Australia and New Zealand. So do you think that could pose a problem if a Kansas alliance was to form? I think immigration is one of those emotional topics which just has to be carefully managed. So fundamentally, I, I don't see a problem uh, with the Kansas vision of free travel between our four uh, countries. But it is one of those emotional topics that your, your local people can often feel a little bit nervous about the topic. So it can happen. I think it has to be treated uh, carefully and uh, step by step. I think the biggest fear is a country is going to get swamped by a whole lot of people from overseas. But that's one of the great things about Kanzuk is when we think of our four countries, um, you know, Canada is not going to be swamped uh, any further with Kiwis any more than we're going to be swamped with Canadians. So it, it's, it's got a balance to it. But we've just got to make sure, in this case, New Zealanders understand that. And I think the best way is just to slowly and gently approach the topic rather than, if you will, scare them by saying, oh, yeah, we're just going to open up the border to all these four countries. That's, that's the sort of thing that freaks a, a local constituency out. Right. And that, that actually goes to my next point, because when people hear open borders, you know, they, they might have different ideas of what that actually means, correct? So I think it is important to be specific in, in what we mean by that, about free movements. I think so. And it's, it's like many things, certainly in politics, um, we've got to move beyond the, the broad, I don't know, statement or slogan at times and, and quietly uh, explain what that's about. So, you know, for Kanzuk, personally, I think based as much free movement as possible, but a small part of it actually just begins with making sure we recognize the credentials, or let's say doctors and vets and engineers from our country, which makes them, you know, the process of coming to another country easier and then saying, okay, well, if you're coming to work, then you don't need um, uh, a visa. If you're wanting to come and study in our universities, we can make that much, much simpler. So it's a, it's a staged process is probably what I'm trying to, to say, moving towards much, much greater cooperation in a way that we do have with Australia. But as you rightly pointed out, that's not just carte blanche or um, completely open either. And Mr. O'Connor, final question. Realistically, how many years do you think um, this will have to take um, to you know, get all four countries eventually to agree on this? Ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a wonderful question. Um, unfortunately for me, it's a, it's a, a how long's a piece of string, but I, I think we are talking years, but I don't think we're talking decades. Uh, and I'm not trying to speak in riddles there, but I, I think this will take a good few years to sort of permeate into the, the public. I, I think COVID paradoxically is slowing down and speeding up the process. It, it slows it down because there is a, I don't know, a fear, a, a worry in a lot of people. You know, mm -hmm. when you talk about opening borders and cooperating more, it makes some nervous. But the paradox, uh, Matt, is that we have a lot of people, certainly in this country, just itching to get out, itching to re-engage right. uh, the world. So if we can tap that side of things, we might be able to speed it up. But my, my own sense is we're still talking a good, a good few years here. Well, Mr. O'Connor, it was a great pleasure having you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Look, thank you for making the time, particularly with our time zone differences. It's always appreciated. Right, of course. Well, thank you for listening. Don't forget to follow Kansas International on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And for more information on Kansas, look up kansasinternational.com for more up-to-date insight on the current events surrounding this project. Till next time.